First reading today from the Old Testament comes from that happy-go-lucky prophet Jeremiah. If you didn't get that joke, you will at the end of the service. I'm sorry. We're we'll reading from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. If you're following along in the Old Testament, page 735. And the passage reads as follows. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write on it their hearts, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or to say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of John. We'll be reading from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Page 106, if you're following along in the New Testament. John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20, and the passage reads as follows. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in the world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said, and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to them. Spoke to them. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, about a year ago, I had to purchase something that I hadn't had to purchase in a very long time. I had to purchase an alarm clock. Because when things break in your house, you wonder how long you had it, right? You look at the, if something breaks, you're like, how long have we really had this thing? Especially if it's old and dirty and decrepit and looks like it still has antennas and, you know, things of that nature. We figured we had this alarm clock about 40 years, because my wife had it before we were married. And we use it up to the point where it's just stopped working. So we had to buy a new one. Now I know most of you are looking at me like, you know, I'm kind of technologically savvy. You're probably asking yourselves, well, you know, you could just use your cell phone. Your cell phone has an alarm on it. Ah, you may be true, but it is a fin it's financially more stable for me to use an alarm clock. And I'll tell you why. For those rare mornings where the alarm clock goes off and somehow it magically jumps from the nightstand, goes across the room and hits the wall. If that happens, it costs me $10. If my cell phone did that, so you see, that's why I use an alarm clock. <laughs> and just in case, in case you were wondering, when you go to your cell phone provider, that accidental insurance policy doesn't cover miracles of that nature. So that being said, we knew we could use our cell phone for the alarm clock, but it, cause, and we thought we might have to, but because it had been so long since we had to buy an alarm clock, we didn't know if they even made them anymore. To my surprise, the story went to actually had them in stock. Okay, they had two, but it was still one more than I needed. So it has this, we bought the new one, and it wasn't like our old one. This was like more of a small cube than it was a long rectangle that we were used to. We brought it home, we set it up, and it worked fine once we figured out what buttons we needed to use. 
to get it to work right. And there were really only two buttons on the machine we needed. The one to set the time, and the one to turn the alarm off. Now I know you guys are just, I got your brains thinking this morning terribly. You didn't find out where that button was at snooze. Everyone loves the snooze button. I don't use a snooze button. I'll tell you why I don't use a snooze button. The snooze button is like the tree with the fruit on it that Adam and Eve ate out of the Garden of Eden. Sure it looks good. Sure you can probably take a bite. But once you use it, it only leads to destruction. I mean, how many of us have heard stories or have been a part of that story where we have been yelled at at the office or terminated from our job with our only excuse being, I just hit the snooze button. However, there was one feature on this clock that our old one did not have. This alarm clock had the ability to automatically change itself during daylight savings time. So you would go to bed as normal and you'd wake up the time would be changed automatically for you. I mean, how cool is that? It was pretty cool the first couple times that it worked. But in the end of last year, in the first part of this year, for some reason, our alarm clock decided to change time to whatever random thought it had. Apparently, as we later discovered, hitting a set, a set of buttons in a particular order changes the time zone inside this clock so that it automatically adjusts when, say, the northern lights in Alaska come off or bad press targets the royal family. It took us some research to figure out which buttons to hit and in what combination to get the, block, to get the clock realizing it was still living in an eastern time zone. In hindsight, I believe it probably would have been easier just not to have this feature on the clock, just to manually change the clock twice a year as we have been accustomed to do for so long. But when it worked, it worked fine. Until it didn't. And I had to figure this out the hard way when I was awakened either an hour earlier before I had to get up. Or worse, an hour later, and had to do the mad dash around the house to try to get a work on time. And a lot of you snooze button people know exactly what I'm talking about. But life is like that, I guess. We are used to certain things happening at certain times, and then all is well. Until it isn't. And I suppose we can all agree that there are a lot of things in life that we can count on most of the time. We can count on when our newspaper arrives. We can count on when the mailman comes. We can count on when certain bills become due. We can count on when law and order is on TV or whatever show you like to watch. Things like that. But there isn't really a whole lot we can count on to happen the same way all of the time. Most of the time, absolutely. All of the time, not so much. Because an alarm clock will continue to wake you up every morning until, say, the power goes out. A car will continue to get you back and forth and around town until one day it just decides not to start. Every weekday at 11 o'clock a.m., you can watch Drew Carey and the Price is Right on TV. Unless the president comes up. Yeah. You get the idea. We get used to living life in a routine of things happening at certain times. And all chaos ensues when things don't fall into the place when they're supposed to. When it comes to the certainties of life, I am reminded of a catchphrase that was made popular by Benjamin Franklin. Now Benjamin Franklin, other than being one of the founding fathers of our country, did many other things throughout his life. He was a politician, he was a scientist, he was a postmaster, and he was an inventor. It was actually Benjamin Franklin that originally proposed the idea for daylight savings time. So if it wasn't for Benjamin Franklin, I would not be having issues with this new alarm clock that I just bought. But he did invent some useful things, such as these bifocal lenses that I have come accustomed to use over the last three years. So on that side, if it wasn't for Mr. Franklin, I would have a much harder time roaming the nets of my salmon. Reading the notes of my sermon, sorry. That's but Benjamin Franklin was also an avid writer, and he did write, although he wasn't the originator of the phrase, in a letter to his friend in France, Jean-Baptiste de la Roy, I love saying that, huh? in 1789, a letter that contained this line, Our new constitution is now established and has appearances of promising permanency, but in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. You all know that phrase. While this phrase was probably written in jest, there are some certainties of this thing, of this phrase to be true. Taxes, however, never seem to change, never seem to have an end to them. Because if there is anything in this world that always stays the same, it's paying our taxes, right? Every year our government require us, requires us to pay them our fair share, but yet it's the government that determines what is fair. And any of you who have had to take care of an estate, heaven forbid, if someone who passes know that even after you have left this earth, the government is still inclined to believe they did not get enough out of you when you were here, that they also feel they need to take a chunk out of you with everything you left behind. 
But while some people have found ways to skirt themselves from paying heavy tax burdens, there has been no earthly human ever that can say they have beaten death. Perhaps in certain instances, there have been people that says they have come close to death. Some people may have found a way to cheat death. Some people have said they probably tried to or have escaped death. But I have done my research on this, and I welcome anyone from the medical community to debate me to the contrary. But according to research and statistics, statistically speaking, 10 out of every 10 people die. There's no way around it. There's no way to avoid it. If nothing else is certain in this lifetime, rest assured, death is certain. Now don't take off your party hats yet, folks. As far as depressing this, as this fact may seem, there is still hope. A hope that was first brought to this world in the prophecies of Jeremiah as we read this morning. Now a little bit of Bible basics for your brain. The name Jeremiah is translated to mean Yahweh, or God, lifts up. Jeremiah was considered to be one of Judah's greatest prophets. His ministry strength spread about half a century during some of the darkest days of the history of Judah. During a time when people were, of Judah were falling from grace, giving in to false idols, believing false prophets, not following them with God's commands, it seems to be a certain theme in the Old Testament that's still happening in the days of Judah and in the days of Jeremiah. Now, even though God had a covenant of an eternal dynasty with his people through his servant David, God also promised that if they strayed away from the ways he directed, that he would give them into their enemies. Now, I can't imagine why God would have to redo such a promise. I mean, the people acted so well when they left Egypt, right? Or they, you know, the whole scratching thing with Noah and the flood, starting everything from scratch, that worked out so well. So God, knowing what would befall these people if they continued on the path they were on, God sent Jeremiah as a prophet to warn the people to turn their ways to repent and return to the Lord, which Jeremiah did many times, over and over and over again. For years, Jeremiah was sounding the alarms and the people of the land were hitting the snooze button. Now, it didn't help matters that the rulers of the day continued to dispel everything that Jeremiah was telling these people saying, Jeremiah was a fool, your lives are going well, what does he know, so forth and so on. And the people failed to see the importance of the news that Jeremiah was directing to these people. Long story short, the people didn't repent. The kingdom of Judah was given into their enemies, which at the time were the Babylonians. The cities destroyed, the houses were destroyed, and the people were left to exile. And Jeremiah got to see this all firsthand, and he felt a deep remorse for the situation that these people had found themselves in. And from that, Jeremiah was henceforth known, or referred to, as the weeping prophet. It's easy to ignore warnings when our lives are going well. The people were certain, used to certainties in their lives because life is good when all goes well, until it doesn't. But even after all this happened to the, to the people of Judah, Jeremiah was still giving people good hope, good news from God, where their lives in exile would eventually be over. And, every, and since everything Jeremiah had warned them about came to be true, people started to listen to Jeremiah about now the good news he was promising from God that we read this morning. From Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. It reads, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them declared the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, I will put my law into their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. God, once again, making a covenant with his people, and you have to wonder why, after how many times his people didn't listen to the word of God or live the lives that God wanted them to live, why would God continue to make covenants? Because let's face it, these people have, do not have a real strong track record of paying attention to God in the first place. Well, the answer is, the answer is simple. And God loves his people that much. God's final word for Israel, after all the destruction, does not continue to be a life of destruction, but a message of salvation. And eventually God does allow them to return to their destroyed cities and to their destroyed homes and restore the people of Judah. And thankfully God continues to do the same for us. God loves us that much that he makes a similar covenant with us 
in giving his son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross, to save us from our sin, and to give us a new life with him in heaven. Jesus said this is why he came here in the first place, reading from our New Testament passage today from John, chapter 12, verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then jumping down to verse 27, Jesus says, now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice from heaven came from heaven saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And it was so. Jesus was glorified when he rose again from the dead, after he gave up his life on that cross for us. And this fact, if for nothing else, is one of the major roots, if not the major root, of our Christian faith. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, if it wasn't for Jesus coming back from the dead, Jesus would just be another guy that said a lot of things about how the world is going to end. And let's face it, we being the people that we were, would probably continue to hit the snooze button. If you've never seen the movie or read the book, The Case for Christ, I would encourage you to do so. Quick premise on this true story. It's about the writer, Lee Strobel, who was an atheist journalist in Chicago. He was on a mission to disprove his wife's Christian faith. Now, I won't go into too many details because I don't want to spoil the book or the movie, whichever your method is that you prefer. But there is one line from the movie that stood out to me that I want to share with you this morning. It's when a colleague tells Lee, if you can disprove the resurrection, you can disprove Christianity. And the bottom line is you cannot disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If for nothing else, there were several witnesses, as I said, that were there at the time that saw him die slowly, painfully on that cross. And these are the same witnesses that came up three days or more later that said, I saw him live. He was alive and well and breathing and he walked among us. That's the new covenant God made with us. Believe in the sacrifice of Jesus and live as God wants us to live. And many of us as believers have accepted that sacrificial gift that Jesus made for us. However, in doing so, we continue to live our lives in our normal rather than God's. We're just as content, content to continue with the lives, the lives that we're living in this day and age. And when those alarms go off, we keep hit, trying to hit that snooze button, putting it off and putting it off, rather than changing our ways to what God would rather us be doing. Does the church need volunteers to help our ministry? Absolutely, I'll be there momentarily. Snooze. Hey, we need people, but some people just lost their house and need help cleaning up. Can you help us? Sure. Snooze. Hey, could you pray for those who are struggling right now and give them a little bit of hope and encouragement? Do that tomorrow. Snooze. We know the covenant God has made with his people. And we need to try to stop living our lives for ourselves and instead giving our lives to God and start living our lives for his glory instead of our own. And the alarms are going off everywhere. Every day, all the time. And when we hear those alarms going off, God still gives us the option to hit that snooze button because he loves you that much that he allows you to make that choice. But truthfully, I don't believe God wants us to hit that snooze button anymore. Honestly, I think God just wants us to wake up. <laughs>